If you haven't finished volume four of Ruby, I would suggest doing that before coming back and watching this. All right. Episode three of Runaways and Stowaways. What happens? Blake hangs out on a boat and talks to the captain. She then ditches her bow as we get to see a mysterious hooded figure. We then cut to Yang as Ty brings her a new robo arm. Yang decides she doesn't want to put the arm on and continues to do chores until they're interrupted by a small panic attack. We then go back to Blake a couple hours later, still just standing around and being mopey. She then notices the mysterious hooded figure, just in time for the boat to be attacked by a totally rad sea dragon. Blake, with the help of the crew, then engage in combat with the beast. The mysterious hooded figure then joins the fray to reveal that their <gasps> son what? The battle continues until the captain succeeds in killing the Grim with the help of our heroes. Blake hits Sun for the first time, and the two discuss where they've been and why they're there, leading to the conclusion that Sun will accompany Blake to her home in Menagerie. Our attention is then pulled to Salem doing things with Cinder. We get introduced to a new Grim while Cinder confirms she did kill Ozpin, and the episode ends with Salem mentioning a relic at Beacon. Alright, so having Blake decide to get rid of her bow was an interesting and unexpected choice. It's so iconic, I figured she'd hold on to it forever. It says a lot about how she's grown to have her get rid of it, and I like that. It means the characters don't feel stagnant. The things they hold on to now may not seem so important later, and that's a really nice way to show character growth. It's also a nice touch that her cat ears are so emotive. It never feels distracting and gives them life, whereas before they were kinda just there. Unmoving. However, small nitpick, when she gets mad her ears go down, but cat ears usually go back. Having her ears swivel may be hard to animate though, and it's fine as it is, just something I noticed. Wow, that sure is some reused animation. But at least Lisa Lavender gets a 3D model now. Lisa Lavender is the Winter Maiden confirmed. The scene with Yang and Tai talking about her new arm is perfectly awkward. Like, Tai was so excited and was obviously kind of bummed that Yang wasn't into it. But Yang's actions seem super believable. It's just a very simple and real interaction. No clunky exposition, no broody monologues, just a talk between a father and daughter. You know, one has to wonder if Ironwood actually wanted to support Yang for fighting admirably, or if he has other plans in mind. Are you a good guy or a bad guy? Stop playing with my heart, Ironwood! Ty has a lot of cool paintings around the house. I wonder if he bought them or if someone painted them. Yeah, Ty's probably a painter. Yang's flashback is really good. It's effective and makes it clear what she's going through. Big props to Barbara, whose performance for that scene was excellent. Yeah, it was technically just gasping, but there was so much fear in it. Great job. One of the best scenes of the volume. <sighs> okay, let's talk about Sun. The only reason I made such a fuss about it obviously being him following Blake is because when I first saw the episode on the Rooster Tooth site, there were so many comments bragging about how they totally called that it was Sun. Like, duh! He's with Blake in the opening. The episode is called Of Runaways and Stowaways. Sun's second line ever is, Hey, a no good stowaway would've got caught. I'm a great stowaway. A line so popular that they made a Valentine's Day card about it. It was so obvious that the hooded figure is Sun that I have to wonder why they even kept up the mystery for so long. While Sun's our focus, let's take a moment to discuss his outfit. It's the same. Characters gaining new outfits does more than simply offer new merch for Rooster Teeth to sell. It denotes growth for the character. It's why Yang doesn't put on her cool new outfit until the last episode. It changes when her character has grown past the recovery stage of her losing her arm. Look at the difference between Volume 4 Ren and Volume 3 Ren. Volume 3 Ren looks like a baby compared to the new design, but Sun's still stuck in Season 1. It doesn't even need to be a drastic change, something as simple as adding a scarf or changing his shirt. We don't need an entire redesign to represent character growth, but something would have been nice. Sun's just as much of a player in this volume story as Blake, so why not change it up a bit? Fucking Ironwood got a redesign, but not Sun? And I'm totally aware that the Ruby crew may have plans to change his outfit later, but I was just disappointed he didn't get a new outfit. Ah, that's a cool Grim! The fight was super fun. I especially like getting to see Blake and Sun use their semblances in interesting ways. Like Blake using one of her doubles to throw herself at the Grim, or when Blake got propelled by Sun's copies. 
I also really like that it wasn't just Blake and Sun being cool and saving the day. The fact that the crew helped was a nice way to use the setting and a cool way to show us how powerful the sea dragon is. Too strong for just Blake and Sun to handle, but with teamwork, anything can happen! The humor in this episode was on point. Jokes were quick and didn't hang on their punchlines too long. Where in the first episode it felt like they set aside time to make sure there was plenty of humor during the fight, here the comedy doesn't take away from the battle. If there's gonna be a fight scene, I want to watch a fight, not a comedic conversation on how to beat the enemy, and they really nailed it here. A little slapstick never hurts, but it sure would be awkward to be expected to laugh at Sun getting slapped here if there's a really serious scene where someone gets slapped later. Uh-huh. Yeah. More voice acting props. Aaron does a great job throughout this whole episode. It helps that Blake gets to express more emotions than just moody. There was a lot of life in her performance, 10 out of 10. Is Sun afraid of flying? Is that why he hides on boats so much? The Seer Grim sounds gross, and I simultaneously hate it and love it. It was great to get a confirmation that Ozpin was dead. It was so vague what had happened to him in the last volume that no one knew if he was still alive or not. That being said, one has to wonder if Salem knows about his... current condition. This next part is something I'm going to call Nitpick Corner. These are all super minor, but I wanted to talk about them anyway. There's a cut when Blake's talking to the captain, and between shots, the two are in completely different poses. At one point, the sea dragon clearly doesn't have a head. It's not a huge problem, but once you see it, you just can't unsee it. The hair on Sun's tail could look better. It kinda just looks pasted on. If they just blended it into the rest of the tail, it'd look better, but it's only really a problem when the tail is close to the camera. Where did Sun's abs go? Similar to episode 1, there's a moment when the monster just conveniently hangs around until the group can finish their conversation. However, it doesn't last nearly as long this time and isn't as noticeable because of that. That's not how physics work. Like, I suspend my disbelief a lot while watching this show, but Sun reacts as if he's supported by something. They should both fall further when she lands on him before jumping up. But like, it was a fun fight, so whatever, who cares. Are we ever going to see the rest of Team Sun again? Why introduce them if you're not going to use them? Why were they considered important enough to be in two of the openings when they haven't done anything? And that's of Runaways and Stowaways. I took an awful lot of tangents in this review because, honestly, there wasn't much to talk about. Aside from the fight, all this episode really did was set up Blake and Yang's stories for the volume. Even the bit with Salem didn't give us any unique information, as the two points to get from it, Ozpin's dead and Salem knows the relic is at Beacon, are told to us again later in the volume. It's a fun episode for sure, as Ruby seems to be at its best when there's a cool fight to be had, and the lighting and scenery all look gorgeous. But other than the battle, the rest of the episode can easily be forgotten. To the point that I had trouble remembering what had happened in this episode before I rewatched it to write this review. To be fair though, the character interactions were top notch, and the scenes that weren't combat oriented were super entertaining as well. Since it's mostly just setting up character arcs, the episode doesn't get to stand out as much as some of the later episodes in the volume. I never actually talked about Blake and Sun's conversation when they go to Menagerie, and I think it's mostly because there's nothing to talk about. It's basically just, you're on a one-woman adventure to fight the White Fang, and she's like, no, I'm going home. Oh, well, can I stay? No, I'm already on the boat. You can stay then. That's like literally basically how it happens. It's just set up. It's all set up. This episode is set up. And even though it's set up, it's still fun because, and not just because of a fight, but because the character interactions are really great. The characters in combat makes it still tons of fun, even on a rewatch.